corruption. And what we're looking at is this idea that, that you and I, man, we kind of just walk through life and we live life in a certain way. Um, and it, how we interact with people, how we do certain things. And we're taking in information all the time about what people think is right or what people think is wrong. And, and we start to kind of build our own narratives around that. And then at some point, if we choose to follow Jesus, then we're kind of confronted with scripture and we're confronted with the gospel and it's gonna call us to live differently than everybody else is living. And so it's gonna kind of give us not just necessarily good advice, but really a totally different way of living. It's gonna interrupt our current lives and then we have to stop and think about it and go, man, maybe there's a better way forward. And so last week, we talked about forgiveness and how we treat the people that we love, that we become a forgiving people um, because God is a forgiving God towards us. And so when we offer up forgiveness, it shows people who God is and it teaches us a little bit about who God is. That even when it's tough, forgiveness is never easy. It's never just like, oh man, I forgive you, we move on. Sometimes it's a hard grinding process, but we lean into that because it's so different from culture who wants to cut people off and be unforgiving. And this week, we're looking at something different in the story of the Good Samaritan. We're not necessarily looking at people that are close to us and forgiving them, but rather people who are very far from us and very different from us. Okay, and so when I was a kid, um, there was about uh, just five minutes from my Nana's house in Little Rock, Arkansas, a place called Chuck E. Cheese. Um, And if middle school still knows what Chuck E. Cheese is, I have good confidence that you guys remember um, that terrible, terrible feet-smelling place. Okay, Um, Chuck E. Cheese is this place, it's this, this wonderful land of subpar pizza and screaming children and scary, like, animal suits, okay? Uh, and when I was a kid, like, my cousins used to really love going, right? And the parents, like, I think even, like, the parents would really love going because it was like they could just sit down and just let us run off. Like, they're like, we'll withstand the terrible music and the screaming just so that way our kid isn't at least sitting right next to us and screaming. And so we would sit there and eat pizza and all stuff. But I because I was a kid ahead of my time, hated Chuck E. Cheese. Absolutely hated it. And it was a problem because my cousin, who's my good friend of this day, would have his birthday every single year at Chuck E. Cheese. And so there's this long, like, period of our life where I just didn't go to my cousin's birthday. So I was like, bro, I love you. That's great. But I do not want to celebrate your birth today um, because you've chosen to do it in what I assume is the equivalent of hell. Like, let's, I don't want to be there. And so within that, We'd go, and, and, and like my parents would kind of like drag me there, and I w- but I would always have to kind of leave early. And here's why. If you've ever been to a Chuck E. Cheese, you go in, there's this big stage, and on that stage are these like animatronic figures, right? And they're all playing music of the worst kind. Um, and they're, they're like, they move really robotically, and they talk to you, and they're terrifying. And on center stage is our good friend, Chuck E. Cheese. And he is like leading the band, and he's this giant eight foot tall rat. Um, and I was like, so I was like, listen, there's not another area of life that eight foot tall rats exist. And from my experience, no one even likes the little ones. So why are we hanging out at a place with ones that are bigger than my dad, which is not hard to do because my dad's five foot six? But I was like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, I don't get what's going on. And so I figured out very quickly, all right, if I just don't go back where the band is, then I don't have to be around these animatronic figurines. But the only problem was is that at that Chuck E. Cheese, there was someone, and sorry to ruin the magic for you, I hope there's, like, sometimes I, is there any small children? I said that one, like I said one time that Santa Claus didn't exist, and there's a small kid in here, so I'd be really careful. Uh, I know. (laughs) Sorry, Brayden. Hate to break it to you. Um, there was somebody that would walk around in the Chuck E. Cheese suit and, like, say hello to all the little boys and girls. And they would walk out, and the kids would run out from the place, and be like, oh, my gosh, this is so good. And they'd be, like, super excited. And I was like, yo, mom, dad, roll out. Let's go. Like, this thing is walking around. There is somebody in a suit. I can't see their human face trying to talk to me. And I did not understand it. Like, it was so terrifying that any time we would go to my cousin's birthday, as soon as the rat came out, like, my parents just knew. Peace out. It's been a great birthday. Sorry we didn't make it to candles this year. And they would load me up, and we would drive off. And all is at peace in the world. I've never returned back. Too many hurt feelings. Same reason why I haven't watched Wizard of Oz lately, because it's a terrifying horror film. Within that, there was this moment where I was like, man, for multiple reasons, right? Eight-foot rat. Um, But the major thing that was terrifying about Chuck E. Cheese for me is that it was something so different than anything that I had ever come like, in interaction with. Like, there was never, like, a point in my life that I was walking down the road, and there were other eight-foot-tall rats walking by that it began to become, like, a normal part of my life. And I was like, oh, hey, yeah, that's really cool. What's up, man? You play the trumpet. This is so good. Like, that it was never a part of my life. And so when I came av- into that room, everything was so different that I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not real. 
and it scares me. Because things that are different terrify us. Right, like even the things that we're excited about when there's change, when there's difference on the horizon, we have like this weird anxiety about it. And even more so, we have that anxiety with people, right? Like there are people that are so different from us um, that even if we're just like, oh man, we're like the most open-minded person in the world and level, like there are still so p- people that are so different from us that come from such a different world that we can't even begin to understand who they are or where they're from. We can't begin to understand their story, and that's a problem because you and I, we kind of interact with people through their stories. Like, we kind, of, we kind of begin to even build people's stories for them before we even meet them. So, like, based off of their race, or how much money they make, or how much money they don't have, or who their parents are, or how many parents they are, there are, or what school they go to, or what area of the town comes We can begin to build a stereotype that's around them, and then we begin to build their story for them and decide who they are based off of what sport they fl- play, or what friends are around them, right? Like, your parents have probably told them that you are, you are the company that you keep, right? And so we begin to build those stories based off of those things. We begin to decide who people are. And what we begin to figure out is there are some people that are very, very far from us. And then there are some people that are very, very close to us. Right? And the people that are close to us largely look like us. They talk like us. We like the same shows on Netflix. We binge the same things. We listen to the same music. We play the same sports. Like we can live in the same world really well. And then there's a person that's really far from us that we have the narrative about them in our head even though we've never met them. And sometimes that narrative is not always good. Right? Sometimes that narrative is made up of things like, well, I heard this about this person, and I know that this is how they act, and I know that this is what they, they do, and this is what their friends do, and this is the family that they come from, and so, so like, they're really bad, and, and I'm really good. And it's incredibly different, and so because they're different, we begin to put labels on them, we begin to treat them differently, and we begin to keep them at a distance. And where we walk into Scripture today is going to tell us, man, how do we treat people that are far from us, that their narrative is so distant from us that we've never actually heard their story? Because within culture, we just go go on with our lives, and we go, oh, okay, like, it's cool. It's normal to just have the people that are around you that are closest to you, that look like you, that talk like you, that are like you. And then the people that aren't like you, like, yeah, you just keep them from at a distance, and you never have to understand them, and you never have to know them, and you never have to understand their hurts or where they come from. You can begin to just make decisions about them based off of what you've heard or what you see from afar. And I remember working in Graham, Texas, and, and Graham, Texas is like a different planet for me. It's like super small town Texas, a lot of families that work in the oil field. Uh, it's very rural. I am not very rural. I can barely say rural. Um, like, uh, like people have cows. Like I've only seen cows like driving by the highway. I'm like, that's one of those things. Uh, like I, this, but it's just a totally different world, and it'd be so interesting. I'd talk to my friends from A&M who had moved to places like Dallas and Houston, and it was so interesting because the way that they would talk about like really, really small town people was that they had this huge lack of understanding about them, and for the first time in my life, because I grew up in white suburbia, like I was like learning to try and figure out, man, who are these people? What are they like? Why do they believe the things that they do? Why do they love the things that they love? And it was for the first time that I was like, man, I have to understand a different people that I've never been around, that I've never hung out with, and I'm the only person in town that wears skinny jeans, right? It was really awkward the first time I walked into a middle school. I've got a sweet sweater. Uh, and one of the middle school girls was like, I've never seen a grown man wear a sweater. Because every grown man she's ever met was wearing Carhartts and camo jackets all the time. And I've never worn one of those in my life. But it was so different. Like, it was this huge tension in trying to get to know, man, okay, who are these people that for largely have stereotypes? What does it look like? How do I treat them and how do I love them even though they're incredibly different from me? Man, we, we lie on opposite sides of the political agenda. We lie on opposite sides even with the people in my same church of what scripture means and what it says and how it is. How do we begin to love them? Because for you and I, the, like, the hardest truth is that people that are distant from us even if we don't like, openly treat them badly, right? Like not very many of us like, walk down the hall and like, spit on kids or something. Right, like not many of us like walk down the hall, like cuss a kid out or beat a kid up or anything like that. Like instead, we we, we just kind of talk about them in our inner circles. We're just like v- roughly unkind to them. We just like very subtly like treat them poorly because they're different from us, or or, or we use what they are as an insult to other people. And it messes with our relational dynamics, and it's actually, like, very normal in culture and what we do, right? Like, it's still a really, really normal thing. Like, if someone happened the other day, one of our middle school kids, like, his insult to me, it was this. Like, his his insult, his go-to was to call me gay, and I was like, that's really weird. 
Because for him, he's so distant, he's so far from the people that he can't even understand someone who struggles with same-sex attraction. And so he's like, oh, yeah, my insult is that you. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, dude, like, is that what you would treat someone who struggles with same-sex attraction? Like, that was like, is that what you would say? Or, or people of us who use language that refers to people with disabilities and, and how we talk about other people and that we use that as insults in those areas too. Like it's, it's this really weird thing that we do because we live in such close circles that we can talk about people that are so far from us. We go, well, they'll never hear it. Well, they're never going to know or they're not around. And it does something weird to our soul. And in the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus has this interaction with this guy who's an expert of the law, um, meaning like he knows Old Testament law really well. He knows God's law really well. And no one ever like often comes to Jesus with like really humble means. Like they never come and they're like, Jesus, I really just want to have a conversation and learn from you. Like that doesn't happen very often. It happens for like 12 dudes, kind of 11, and, and some of like those people. But most people are trying to come, they're trying to trap Jesus because he's gaining a following and all these things. And so this guy comes into contact with Jesus and they're going to get in this interaction, and here's what it says in verse 25. The expert in the law stood up to test him, which is not, again, that's not like, let's sit down and have coffee, saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life, which is also always interesting. Everyone, uh, it's like the church has not changed that much today. Everyone's answer is like, how do I get to heaven, right? Like, that's his, that's his moment. What must I do? And so Jesus asks him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man answers, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself, which is interesting, because at another point in in an event in Jesus' life, he's asked, what are the greatest commands? He says to love God and to love people. So he gives a really good answer. Like, it's Jesus' answer. You can't, like, it's that moment in small group when they're like, and what do you do? And you're like, pray, worship, and read the Bible. Like, that guy gives, like, his best small group answer right there in that moment. And Jesus goes, you've answered correctly. Or I pat him on the back, like, good expert of the law. And he told them, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the, the expert on the law, he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? It's important to know that for the Jewish people, for all of time, the God is the God of the Jewish people and the Jewish people only. And so he's trying to trap Jesus into, into saying, hey, your neighbor are other Jews. But everyone else, that's not your neighbor. So you only have to treat other Jews well. And everybody else, though, you can treat like complete garbage. Instead of just like answering directly, Jesus begins to tell a story because Jesus is a storyteller. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. There's nothing like robbing someone and then also leaving them almost dead and naked. A priest happened to be going down that road, a pastor or a religious official. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side, meaning he saw him, moved to the other side of the road, and then kept walking. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? It's at this point that the guy who's asked the question is forced into an answer, because now everybody sitting there would have known, like the nice guy, the nice guy was the neighbor. That's pretty much what he says. He goes, "The, the man that showed mercy to him. And Jesus says, So go and do the same. Now what's interesting about that story is that the man is, the expert of the law is trying to get God, or to get Jesus, God in the flesh, to say, who is God the God of? Who do I have to treat well? And he wants him to say the Jewish people. And Jesus says, no, God is not the God of just Jews. God is the God of everyone, and so you show mercy on everyone, even the person that is furthest from you. What's interesting is that the Samaritan enters into danger. This is a road that was like notorious for crime happening, like the other person kind of had the robbery coming to him. Um, Like it was not uncommon. And so this guy also knowing that is walking along a dangerous road, goes across to someone who is half naked, uh, fully naked, half dead, 
And when no one else wants to help him, not even the pastors, not even the religious people, like none of that, he enters into this guy's life, helps him, and he doesn't just help him a little bit. Like he doesn't just like, okay, in the very least, like I'll take him to the hospital. He gets him there and then pays for everything and takes care of him. He shows the fullest extent of mercy to this person. Someone who he doesn't know and someone who is so unlike him, who believes differently than him who historically their people just treated each other awfully. And yet he enters into his life to help him. What we see is this, is that people, all people, no matter their narrative, have hurts. Like bad things happen. And what's interesting too is the Samaritan doesn't go in and go, yeah, but what did he do to deserve to get robbed? He was probably making some bad decisions. He probably had it coming for him. Like, it was, probably, it was probably like karma. Like, he probably did a bad thing, and so a bad thing happened to him, which, by the way, karma doesn't exist. It's not in Scripture. It's nothing from God. It's something we made up, which, by the way. He doesn't ask any of those things. He just simply sees someone hurting, and then he goes to their assistance. He serves them, and he loves them. Like, like that's the most loving thing you can do is rescue someone who's almost dead. And we go, oh, yeah, of course, like, we would totally, if if we saw someone like that. And I go, I don't think so, man. Like, I just don't, I just don't think so. He goes out of his way, puts his own life at risk to help someone and to love someone. But for us, man, people that are far from us and different from us, we can't even just be, like, generally kind to or about. We can't just not gossip about people. Much less are we going to put ourselves in danger for somebody that we don't even know. See, what culture will tell us and what the world will tell us and and what your friends will tell you and your parents and everybody around you is that it's okay to just have your group and only be nice to your group and other people just aren't going to like fit into that thing and and it's just not going to make sense. But the gospel tells us not that you have to be best buddies with everyone and everybody's got to be your secret keeper, but in the very least, kindness should exude from you. Mercy should come out of your pores and you should be able to have empathy on people that are directly different from you. That I should be able to see people that are different from me enter into their life and say, man, what hurt are you going through? Because you and I both know that you struggle with stuff and I struggle with stuff that no one else knows about and we wish that someone would ask us about it or walk with us in it. And instead of that, we turn around and look at other people who are going through their own crap and then we pull it on them too. And the worst part is when we do it to each other. Like that's the thing that hurts. Like, why do people hate God? Let me tell you, because they're dying in the ditch and we don't care. Like, we don't care. Why do people hate God? Because the church looks all, we all look the same. Because we look around and we go, well, yeah, those are the church people, and those are this. And we can't, in ourselves, find mercy and compassion and empathy for people that are a long way off and different from us. And that is not the gospel, the Jesus that you and I first fell in love with, the Jesus that was so moving in our lives that we said, I will give my life to that Jesus. The, the Jesus that we love is the one who came for us when we were far off, when we were far away. Not the Jesus that, that talked bad about us and that wouldn't rescue us, but that would rescue us. And then we go, well, man, that's good because God did that for me, but I could never do that because I'm not God. That's not following Jesus. Following Jesus, the Holy Spirit resides in us to teach us to be like him, to convict us when we are not, to move forward that people would see God, that it would interrupt our lives, that we would treat people better than other people treat people, but, but we, we do the same thing. That when people go, what are the Christians like in your school? They wouldn't say, oh man, they hate everybody else. They talk bad about everybody else. They do all the same things we do. The only difference is is that on Wednesday night, like I get to do my homework or take a nap at home and they have to sit in chairs and listen to that idiot. Like instead that they would go, what are the Christians like in your school? I mean, the Christians see hurting people and then they go and they are part of the rescue. They have compassion on them. They have mercy on them. Like that is what Christianity should look like. And we don't go, well, what do they do, though? Well, how do they end up there? They don't ask 57 questions about their sin or about their life or about those things. No, like, they just go help hurting people. They just go see hurting people, and they come to the rescue. 
whether they look like them or talk like them or not, whether they're the druggies in your school, whether they're the potheads, whether the kids sleeping around, whether the kids that are getting blackout drunk every night, you go to them, you see their hurt, and you help them because that is who God is. It doesn't mean they have to be your best friend. It just means you have to learn what mercy is. And some of us can start with learning to have mercy on each other, treating each other with that same kindness. Being a dad is like the weirdest thing in the world. I say that a lot, and it keeps getting weirder. I don't see it changing in 18 years. And every night, even though my kid has no idea what I'm saying to her at any time, but because Haley insists, we read a book to her. And we cycle the same books all the time. Because, again, she don't know. And Haley really loves to force me to read, and so I am really getting in children's book mode. Let me tell you, I'm a pro. And one of Haley's favorite books to read to Emery is this one, Dear Girl, which I'm like, my girl has a name, okay? I have a room. And we read it, and within this book, there are all these moments, and they're like, it's, it's okay to cry, like, it's okay to be happy, and it, like, walks through emotions and all these things, and I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. And then there's a weird page, it's like, and there are no rules on what to wear, and I'm like, ha ha, yes, there are. Um, like, uh, there's all these moments. And then there's this really interesting moment, and I remember thinking, like, I want to write the author a thank you letter. And I had it marked, and now I've got to flip to it. Here you go. And it's this moment, and there's, like, really short sentences. Okay, this isn't Harry Potter. This is, like, three total statements in here. But every time we get to it, I'm like, that's, like, one of the most important things that I want my kid to know, because I wish that I would have known that, because I am the worst of the worst. When I talk about showing people like empathy and mercy and compassion, there are some times that I get around a group of friends and there are people that are there that are like, hey, Lane, remember when you did this to me? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I hate my life. I want to go hide in a corner and die. And I go, man, if there's one thing that I can teach my kid, it's like, it's this, it's this page because if there's one thing within this book that is not Christian from what I can tell, it's th- like, this is the gospel right here. And it says this, dear girl, pictures, here we go. I'll read it like I read to you because Emery, I think she just sees like colorful blobs. She's like, bobblehead nose. Dear girl, find people like you. And apparently the people like her play soccer. Um, I wish they played basketball, but they play soccer. So it was real. And then on the other page it says, and find people unlike you. And then we get the, you know, stereotypical rebels that skateboard, do art, and listen to heavy music. Um, And I'm like, I just draw a picture of daddy over here. Um, But I read that and I go, Book over, don't need the next five pages. Because the most important thing that I want my kid to know is that your world is so small and I want you to find people like you who understand you and get you and love you, but I want you to find people that teach you to expand your knowledge of the world and to see people for who they are and to understand stories and narratives. You aren't a judgmental person, you are a loving person because your God is a loving God. Find people like you, find people unlike you because if there isn't people around you that are unlike you, then you're missing out on who God is. That's what I want my kid to know. That's what I want you to know. If you look around and you go, man, everybody around me looks like me, then get the crap out of your circle. Like, get out of it. Go make a new friend. Go sit at a different table. Go walk down a different hall. Because the people that are different from you, the people that you don't understand, the more that you can begin to understand them, the more that you can understand who God is, and to miss out on knowing who God is, is to miss out on knowing how God loves you. That when you were dead and in a ditch and sin left you there and nobody wanted anything to do with you, your God came and rescued you. When you were far off. Jesus, when I was far off, Sin has killed me in so many areas of my life. And when I was in that state, my God came and found me. How dare anybody else know anything else from the church? If people come into our building and they don't find kindness in loving people, then we suck. If people's experience with us, with the body of Christ, is that we are the meanest of the mean, is that we have no mercy and no compassion, then we're not showing them God. We're showing them hell. My God is one of compassion and mercy and empathy and deep love for the person dead in the ditch, for the person far off. 
by his grace, I will have that kind of mercy and compassion and empathy. The Good Samaritan is not about just pulling over and helping someone jumpstart their car, although maybe that's a great start. It's about knowing that our God is not just the God of you and your friends, he's the God of your school and that your school deserves to know him. Not because they're good people, but because God wants them as his own in the same way that he wants you. We're going to head into small groups. I'm going to pray for us. Here's the deal. If the Jesus that you chose to follow is any different than that version of Jesus, then you don't know Jesus. You know some fake version of him. If your God is not one of compassion and mercy and empathy that wants to see all people know him, that's not the God of Scripture. And if we cannot be a place that has mercy and love for the people that are the furthest from us and the people that are close to us, then what are we doing? I want to follow Jesus well because I spent too much of my life not following him well. And I don't want you to tell that same story at 26.